We're continuing on our study of the Lord's Prayer. I started the study on March, uh, March 4th. I spoke on the first part of this, and I broke it down into basically nine, uh, nine sections, teaching three sections each part. And uh, we're on to the final three sections here tonight. And uh, we spoke so far uh, on this prayer. And it's a model for all prayer. Obviously, the Lord's Prayer was not given to just be recited as a ritual. It is actually given to us as the Lord's outline for prayer. And there is something tremendously important about, about the way Jesus answered the disciples' question. Lord, teach us to pray. Jesus' reply was, pray like this. Or, when you pray, say this. We spoke about our Father which art in heaven, which is recognizing who He is. We stop and we recognize that He is God Almighty, that He is our Heavenly Father. Amen. We can turn to Him as His children for everything that we need. He is our Heavenly Father. We talked about how Thy name be hallowed, which represents worship. We talked about Thy kingdom come, which represents guidance. And we also talked about Thy will be done, which is yieldedness. Then we went into on earth as it is in heaven. And then we went into the us section, on earth, give us bread. It talks about provision, not just food, but the necessities that we have for life, the, the needs that we have. Amen. We need to recognize that he supplies that. And then we talked about forgiveness. Then we stepped into the third part here tonight, keep us from temptation. Talking about victory. Do not lead us into temptation. Matthew chapter 6 verse 13 tells us but deliver us from evil. The request to forgive us our debts was forgiveness for sins that we already committed. But here we have a plea to be delivered from falling into new sins, being taken over by new temptations. It's a prayer for protection, for a prayer for protection over our souls. And God does not lead us into a life that is free from temptations, but he teaches us how to look to him for the strength in dealing with temptation. The key to understanding what this phrase means is to understand that the word temptation has two meanings. It can mean to tempt with the goal of causing one to sin, or it can mean a test or trial to prove the validity of one's faith. Obviously, God never tempts anyone with the goal of causing them to sin. James chapter 1, verse 13 tells us, Let no one say when he is tempted, I am tempted by God, for God cannot be tempted by evil, nor does he himself tempt anyone. God never tempts anyone of evil, but he does test us. James explained earlier on in his letter, knowing he says, knowing that the testing of your faith produces patience, but let patience have its perfect work, that you may be perfect and complete, lacking nothing. Others have already faced the same temptations that we encounter. Paul explains, no temptation has overtaken you except such as is common to man. We all face different things. We all go through things that tempt us, that try to draw us away from God. The goal is to try to turn to God in those times so that He can give us the strength to, to be able to turn away from them. Paul also explains that God places limits on the tests that we face. He says, but God is faithful, who will not allow you to be tempted beyond what you are able. But with the temptation will also make the way of escape that you may be able to bear it. We must realize the reality of spiritual warfare. We cannot be victorious over that which we do not understand. Being ignorant of the fact that there is a great spiritual battle being fought in our world does not erase the fact that it is true. Our spiritual war warfare requires spiritual weapons. Temptation is not to be fought with human willpower. The way to resist temptation is to lean heavily upon God's grace to strengthen and enable us to stand against the wiles of the devil. 2 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 3, it tells us, For though we walk in the flesh, we do not war according to the flesh. For the weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but mighty in God for the pulling down of strongholds. The Apostle John and John in 1 John, he says that the world is a trap that is made up of three things. He says the lust of the flesh, which means the desires of the flesh. The lust of the eyes, desiring the things that are not ours. And the pride of life, it involves putting self on the throne of our lives. Putting us 
first, our needs first, putting ourself. The false impression given by Satan that whatever wrong we are contemplating really is not that serious. The temptation, first of all, these, these are the different progressions in temptation. We also face uh, that the temptation presents a picture of some action that in some way appeals to our inner needs. Satan makes us see something or someone or some situation which he is sure will appear to us. And what might appeal to me might not appeal to you and vice versa. And then a desire is, is uh, put within us. James chapter 1, it says, but each one is tempted when he is drawn away by his own desires and enticed. And then we begin to toy with the idea. We play with it. We fantasize about it. It's at this point that we have already begun to fall for Satan's lies. We proceed to act on what was being presented to us, but the moment we give in, we are dismayed and disgusted by our own defeat. We try to hide our sin. We attempt to excuse it or hide it from God and others. We need to acknowledge our deficiency in dealing with our own temptation. We can't deal with it our own. We don't have the strength. We don't have the capacity to take care of it ourselves. We need to remember everyone is vulnerable to temptation. No one is above falling. No one. No matter how old we are, no matter how mature in the faith, it doesn't matter if you've been in the church for 30 years, 60 years, or one day. Maybe this is your first time joining us today online. No one is immune to temptation. We are never free from temptation as long as we live in this world. We need to ask for deliverance. We need to know how to pray for spiritual protection for ourselves. The Apostle Peter gave us a powerful illustration of the danger of trying to stand against temptation in our own power. And Jesus at the Last Supper, he taught the disciples that greatness was to be found through service. Not through lifting ourselves up, not through any sort of lust, but found through service. And he says, right in the middle of this discourse, turns to Peter and says, Simon, Simon, indeed, Satan has asked for you that he may sift you as wheat. But I have prayed for you that your faith shall not fail. And when you have turned, returned to me, strengthen your brethren. Peter objected. He said, Lord, I'm ready to go with you. I'll do whatever you want both to prison and to death, whatever it takes, God, I'm, I'm by your side. And Jesus' response was, I tell you, Peter, the rooster shall not crow this day before you will deny me three times that you even know me. When we pray for God's protection from temptation, we are agreeing, that the high priestly, we are agreeing with the high priestly prayer of Jesus. He prayed, I do not pray that you should take them out of the world, but that you should keep them from the evil one. And the second part, uh, the second section is deliver us from evil. Matthew chapter 6, verse 13, it says, but deliver us from the evil one in the New King James Version. Lead us not into temptation indicates that the child of God was conscious of past sin and failure and feel, fearful of falling into yet further sin. But when you use the phrase deliver us from the evil one, you are admitting that this life is a struggle with an enemy that opposes us. We need help. We can't do it on our own. We need deliverance. And we can't deliver ourselves. Because we do not know what dangers we will face each new day, we need God's protection to cover us. When you pray, deliver us from the evil one, you are turning your protection over to God. You're saying, God, you protect me. I can't protect myself. I don't have my own back. I can't keep this myself. I, I need you to protect me. There is no part of life that is not touched by evil. It has ruined our circumstances. It has marred our character. It has affected all of God's creation. Romans chapter 8, verse 22, it says, For we know that the whole creation groans and labors with birth pains together until now. Not only that, but we also, who have the first fruits of the Spirit, even we ourselves groan within ourselves, eagerly waiting for the adoption, the redemption of our body. The Lord's Prayer recognizes evil as a deadly fact. Many people have fallen into, yet many Christians have never stopped to realize the nature of the spiritual batter, battle in which we are engaged. Part of the problem is that we live in a society that has fictionalized the existence of the evil one. The devil has been, a pray, been portrayed as evil in appearance, 
when portrayed in movies, he always has this sinister appearance. He always looks terrifying. Yet the Bible says that he can appear as the angel of light. 2 Corinthians chapter 12, chapter 11, sorry. Satan was originally a powerful angelic being, a wise and beautiful cherub named Lucifer. Pride led to rebellion described in Isaiah and again described in Ezekiel. And Lucifer became proud because of his wisdom and beauty, and he declared, I will be like the Most High. And he had this pride that rose in him and led him to rebellion. He sought to make himself equal to God and aspired to be worshipped. Because of his sinful heart, he was cast from heaven by his Creator. He will be known as the Hebrew name Satan, which means adversary. Satan is also called the devil from the Greek word diabolos with the meaning of slanderer or accuser. The angels who joined Satan in his rebellion against God are referred to as evil spirits or demons. According to Revelation chapter 12, those demons were cast out of heaven along with Satan. According to Revelation chapter 12, he, he took one-third of the angelic population with him. It was Satan's sin that introduced evil into the universe. Later, Satan, he misrepresented God's motives to Adam and Eve. God had created such a beautiful thing in the Garden of Eden with Adam and Eve, and Eve's original name in the Hebrew, in the, in the Hebrew is Hava, which means life. God literally created life, and Satan was out to destroy that life. They had been created sinless in the image of God, but they were given the freedom to choose whether to obey their creator because they chose to believe Satan and ate the fruit that had been forgiven by God. Through their sin, sin entered into the human race. Ever since, Satan has been an evil force in every generation. Satan is a created being and there, therefore is no equal to God. He is not God's opposite in power. He doesn't contain the same power that God has. God has all power. God has all authority. As a created being, he is underneath God's control. He is subject to the limitations of being a creature. He cannot be everywhere at the same time. He is not all-powerful. He is not all-knowing. The Bible describes him in John chapter 8 as the father of lies. In 2 Corinthians chapter 4, of, as the God of, of this age. In Matthew, Matthew calls him the prince of demons. John, he calls him the prince of this world. Ephesians, Paul's letter to the Ephesians, he calls him ruler of the kingdom of the air. We must be prepared for the attack of the enemy. There are many factors that contribute to Satan's success. First, although he is not equal to God, he is of an order of creatures that is higher than man, although, and Hebrews chapter tw uh, 2 tells us, he was created as an angel. Scripture tells us that we don't need to fear Satan. We don't need to be afraid. Because he who is in you is greater than he who is in the world. But too many Christians rely on fleshly strength to deliver them from Satan. When things start happening in life and weaknesses appear, we rely upon our own strength. We think, I can get out of this my own. I can do this myself. When in all actuality, we need God. We need God in every single moment of every single day. We need Him in the good times. We need Him in the bad times. We need Him when we're on the mountaintop, and we need Him when we're in the valley. Our confidence does not lie in ourselves, or it should not lie in ourselves, or in our ability to counteract evil, but rather in the character and strength of the Almighty God who can deliver us. James wrote in chapter 4, Therefore submit to God, resist the devil, and he will flee from you. Here he is using a verb tense that means to take a, a stand. Take a stand against the devil, and he will flee from you. The Apostle Peter advises Christians that they should not give in to Satan, but resist him steadfast in the faith. Our best defense against evil is a right relationship with God. Scripture warns a believer that we must be prepared. We must be prepared. Jesus warns his disciples in Mark chapter 14, watch and pray lest you enter into temptation. The spirit indeed is willing, but the flesh is weak. Paul warned the Ephesians, he said, Put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. The armor is given so that we might stand against our adversary. 
This covers, for example, the belt of truth. It was the soldier's belt that held all the armor in place. It is the truth that holds all that we believe in place. Since Satan depends on deception to maintain his power, our first line of defense is to know the truth. Know the truth. The breastplate of righteousness. The breastplate protected the vital organs. It protected the heart, the lungs, the kidneys. It is righteousness that protects us in those vital areas in our relationship with God. Any sin in our lives leaves an opening in our armor through which Satan can attack us. The shield of faith, the Roman soldiers, their shield was large enough that they could take shelter behind it. They could duck behind that and find safety in, t- in, in times of battle. And in order to quench the fiery darts of Satan's temptations, we must seek to know and apply God's truth to every area in our lives. The helmet of salvation, it is the knowledge that we are saved that provides protection from Satan's sword of discouragement and doubt. There will be no doubt that as soon as you experience the mighty power of God's salvation, there will be doubt that will rise in your heart that will tell you, no, you didn't receive it. No, you didn't experience God. That doubt is from Satan. And we need the helmet of salvation to protect us from that. The sword of the Spirit, lastly, is God's Word. And it is our only offensive weapon. It can only be used effectively if we know its promises. If we can pull the promises out of the Word of God and say, Satan, you say this over my life, but this is what God says over my life. You may say that I'm already defeated, but God says that, that I'm the victor. You may say that, that Satan, you're going to overcome me, but his Word tells me that I am an overcomer. Although Satan may be the ruler of this present evil world, Though he may be the prince of the power of the air, though he may have cohorts of evil spirits at his command, he has no claim over the children of God, nor does he have any power to tempt them except what the Father allows. Sometimes God chooses to take his child out of suffering almost immediately. Sometimes he chooses to let his child remain in it for a lifetime. But you can be assured of this, that he always goes with us through it. And ultimately, he is going to deliver us from evil by taking us home to be with him. Psalm 121, David wrote these words. He penned these words. He said, the Lord shall preserve you from all evil. He shall preserve your soul. The Lord shall preserve your going out and your coming in from this time forth and even forevermore. And lastly, but not least, he ends his prayer by saying, for yours is the kingdom, the power and the glory forever. Amen. We began our prayer and praise to God, acknowledging Him as the Father and honoring His holy name. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be Your name. Holy is Your name. We then affirm God's priorities as our own. Your kingdom come. Let Your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Everything that is in heaven right now that's existing, we want to be existent upon this earth. We then ask for God's provision for our lives here and now. Give us this day our daily bread. And then we ask for God's pardon and commitment. Commit ourselves to forgive others. Lord, forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And then we seek God's protection from temptation and satanic attacks and engage in spiritual warfare ourselves. And then he ends it by saying this. Finally, we return to praise. And as we claim the authority the power and glory of God. For yours is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. David's prayer in 1 Chronicles chapter 29, he says, yours, O Lord, is the greatness, the power and the glory, the victory and the majesty for all that is in heaven and in earth is yours. Yours is the kingdom, O Lord, and you are exalted overhead of all. Well, man has an ego that needs to be stroked by praise. God does not. Yet he calls us to praise him. He calls us to worship him. He even commands it. Why? Not because he needs praise, but because we need to praise him. Praise does something for us. It reminds us of God's greatness and of his glory. It alters our perspective. It changes our attitude. In the three terms of the closing portion of this prayer, we are confessing that God exclusively possesses these things. Yours is the kingdom, the power, 
the glory forever. We are saying that these things can be said of God and no one else. Yours is a kingdom. The wonderful truth is not that Jesus is going to be king, that, but, but that he is king now. When we pray yours is a kingdom, we are acknowledging the fact that the present day reality that Jesus is king. When we pray yours is a kingdom, we are also recognizing that we are subjects of the king. We are freely acknowledging his right to lordship over our lives. Yours is the power forever. The Old Testament refers to God as almighty 56 times. The New Testament has, has just as much. In Colossians chapter 1, it says, He is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn over all creation. For by him all things were created that are in heaven and that are on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or dominions or principalities or powers. All things were created through him and for him. And he is before all things, and in him all things consist. And he is the head of the body, the church, who is the beginning, the firstborn from the dead, that in all things he may have the preeminence. Yours is the glory forever. Amen. This portion of the prayer is called a doxology. Doxology literally means speaking glory or a word of glory. The word comes from a combination of two Greek words, doxa, which means praise or glory, and logos, which means word. So doxology is an expression of praise to God, a confession of adoration. Doxologies of praise are found in both the Old Testament and the New Testament. As we have already seen in 1 Chronicles chapter 29, David's words, Yours, O Lord, is the greatness, the power, and the glory, the victory, and the majesty. And in closing... We read in the New Testament in Revelation chapter 5, verse 13, it says, And every creature which is in heaven and on the earth and under the earth and such are as are in the earth and all that are in them, I heard saying, Blessing and honor and glory and power be to him who sits on the throne and to the Lamb forever and ever. He alone is worthy of our praise. The last part of this prayer is the word amen. The word amen is a Hebrew exclamation which expresses a strong assertion. It literally means it shall truly and certainly be. This prayer that he put forth, he ends it by saying, it shall truly and certainly be. All the words that he spoke to us today, all the promises that we have to hold on to, it shall truly and certainly be. Amen. And in closing... We're going to close with prayer and uh, just going to pray also for Pastor and Sister Carter and their travels. And tonight is normally when we do our, the uh, prayer mantle, which we take from house to house each different week. Different home has that, and they pray over it. They pray for power, protection, and provision for our pastor and pastor's wife. Amen. We love them dearly, and we want to pray for them. Amen. So if you'll join me in prayer. God, we pray for Pastor and Sister Carter and their travels here today. God, we pray, Lord, that you would help them as they're on vacation, that you would keep them safe. Lord, bring them back to us safe. Allow your protection to be upon their life. God, I pray, Lord, that you would provide for them, Jesus, whatever they have need of. Lord, and that you would allow the power of the Holy Ghost to direct them and guide them, Lord, as you see fit. God, let your will be done in their life. In Jesus' mighty name. God, we thank you for this opportunity to worship you here today. God, I know that the circumstances have been different for everyone, Lord, but I pray, God, that you would allow your mighty presence to do its work. God, I pray, Lord, Jesus, you have no limitations. You're not limited by walls. You're not limited by buildings, God. God Lord, but you sit on the throne. You are king now. God, you're king over our life now. You were on the throne. You were in control. Right now, Jesus, and so we turn to you and we ask, God, that you would let your will be done all throughout the course of this week. Have your hand upon us. Protect your people. In Jesus' mighty name, amen. Amen. Thank you so much for joining with us today.